Look, I'm just a geologist. I like rocks. I love rocks. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Geology Flannel Cast. My name is Steve. Hey, everyone. I'm Chris. Uh, Guten Abend. <laughs> Ooh. Y- y- R- Jesse. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everyone, to the premier geology podcast. Everyone doing all right today? Yeah, we're you doing know, great. Yeah. Doing, doing great. That's what I like to hear. Today is, uh, when we're recording this, is January 20th, 2021. Nothing of note today. So, <laughs> <laughs> except for the premiere podcast doing Cold Part 2. That's what we're doing. You know, coming back. I'm sorry. Did I spoil it, Chris? Well, I don't think it was a spoiler. We said last week we we're doing call part two. So. <laughs> uh, will they? Won't they? I don't know. Got a, got a lot of things on Twitter. We're following through. You know, it's just, that's that's what we do. The people wanted to know about about coal, and you know, we're doing it. Yeah, Chris. Chris bought his coal hat again today. I yeah, actually, I actually brought has- a piece of coal for the podcast today. Look at that. Super shiny. So what is it? Thornburg? That's anthracite. Boom. Yeah, I just brought my myself because it's part of my being. Yes. It's upbringing too. Also, See? I think like growing up in the coal region, you, you have micro amounts of coal embedded into you from like falling over oh. piles, playing in the woods and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you're born in the rest of the country, you get like the MMR vaccine. When you're born in coal country, they just bathe you in dust. From the coal plants, yeah, we can actually talk. We'll talk a little bit later about what that is made of. Oh, fly, fly ash, the Can't fun wait. stuff, fly oh. ash, bottom ash, oh, slag. Oh, baby, we're getting all into this today. Jesse is, I can just see it right now. He's, I, I am personally really happy that you're so excited about this. You're a convert, <laughs> a convert, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The, the wild wild world I, I will say this this week upon in or researching the environmental side of things um i was hooked i was like holy crap this is a really really cool topic like i really really got into the research this weekend or this week yeah, this is essentially where our science started it started with coal more or less yeah, yeah that's a good point i mean yeah. Those we, old we really yeah. yeah you know stratigraphy coal fossil like all of it yeah. trying to came. you know is there a science behind figuring out where the coal is you know how do we how do we more efficiently find where the coal is and you know and learn more how does it form what are we looking for and stuff like that mm-hmm. what gods do we have to pray for to get it to show up more things like that <laughs> science something like that i don't know science <laughs> <laughs> well should we uh, should we just dive into this? Yeah, uh, but again, uh, so we do have uh, Twitter, we do have Instagram, we do have Facebook, and there was a little Twitter poll that we put out there oh, yeah. regarding uh, what is your favorite coal? Is it lignite, subbituminous, bituminous, or anthracite? And Chris, everybody's hanging on the edge of their seat. What what was the uh, final result there? Yeah, who was the winner? Who's yeah. who's the loser? Who came in last? Uh, yeah, who came who in last? Came in last? Oh, I'm sorry to say, but last place came to sub bituminous. You guys, zero percent of the vote was to sh- nobody. Nobody out there in the Twitter world voted for sub bituminous. I mean, it just goes to show <clears throat> our listeners have good taste. Yeah, they're informed. <laughs> they know what's up. They listen to the last podcast, obviously. Six point seven percent of the people out there that voted voted for lignite. Mm. Um, then forty percent of the people voted for bituminous, which makes sense. That's you know, but sub bituminous and bituminous make up most of the coal that is mined. So, man, I want to say was isn't it? No, actually, no. Never mind. I'm not even going to say I, that's an incorrect thing. Yeah. I was going to say anthracite um, is like negligible on yeah, the scale. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anthracite was the winner. 53.3% of the people polled on Twitter poll Ooh. said anthracite was their favorite. So there you go. If you'd like to participate in more geology flannel cast polls, check out our Twitter site, our Twitter page, actually. Uh, we're at geo flannel cast. All right, let's jump into this. So today's episode 
is based on more of kind of the environmental side of things of, of coal. So if you're interested, if this is the first time you're listening to the podcast and you want to hear about kind of how coal forms and we go last week, we talked about the formation of coal, uh, coal mining. Uh, we talked a little bit about the history of it. Uh, and what else did we talked about last week? That's pretty much it. Right. I think. Yeah. yeah a little I, bit. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that yesterday was more of like how call forms and kind of like the straight up, you know, geology side of things. Today's going to be more of the environmental side of things, kind of some of the environmental consequences of, of using coal for energy. And, um, I don't know what you're talking about. Clean coal done. Yeah. Let's let that. No, no environmental impacts moving on. Okay. So that's the first thing on the outline. Here. <laughs> Clean coal, so that's an excellent, um, Excellent segue into this. All right, so let's uh, let's start off the day talking about clean coal. Okay, there's this topic. Uh, you know, it, it gets it gets tossed around a lot. Clean coal, clean coal. You know, it's great, it's great, it's great. Okay, so one. So my biggest criticism right now, before we even start talking about clean coal, so it's more well, clean coal. It seems after doing all this research on figuring out what does clean coal actually mean it doesn't actually cover anything involved with the mining of coal. So we'll get into, that's one of the big topics I have today that we're going to talk about is kind of some of the consequences of, of mining coal and just how potentially bad for the, for the environment mining coal can be, if not properly taken care of. Clean coal doesn't account for any of that. And kind of what we said, we, I think we believe we ended, it, ended the podcast last week talking about it doesn't matter what resource you're extracting from the earth for energy. There's no, you know, quote free lunch, right? There's always yeah. going to be some type of impact to the environment. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're, you know, mining resources for solar panels or if you're, you know, mountaintop removal or strip mining for coal, regardless, there is always some type of environmental impact, right? Yeah. So we're looking at like the life cycle analysis of it. Like, from cradle to grave, from taking yeah. it out of the ground to what happens to it after we're done using it. Yeah. So let's get into this term, clean call. So the term clean call really began to be popularized back in 2008 by call industry groups, by, by lobbyists in the, in the United States. Jesse Thornburg. And specifically Jesse Thornburg, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Trust me, if Jesse was making that lobbyist money, he would not be doing a geology podcast right now. <laughs> <laughs> or he'd be sponsoring us, I hope. <laughs> or he'd be sponsoring us right now. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would be arguing that there is such a thing as clean coal. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's great. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Coal keeps the lights on, fellas. It does. Okay. It does. So does legal marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into that lobbyist group, too. Well, that took a turn. All right. <laughs> I was just trying to think of another controversial lobbyist group. Carry on. Yeah, there, there's a lot of them. And you like, <laughs> know why I went there. Just uh, he's anywho. a little stressed out right now. So uh, just give, <laughs> give him a break. His eyes are a little bloodshot. So, you know, just <laughs> it's been a long day. It's been a long day. All right. So let's get back to this term clean call. All right. So we already went off on tangent number one. Really doing a good job sticking it, sticking to the outline right there. All right. So I said it was popularized in 2008 by coal industry groups, all right? And what was happening during this time, the U.S. Congress was, was contemplating uh, climate change legislation, all right? So, uh, you know, whenever you're talking about climate change, trying to, trying to make legislation to promote, uh, to uh, try to alleviate climate change, I guess you could say, coal is always under, under the spotlight, okay? So the lobbyists came out with this term, clean coal, all right? And they deliberately made this term vague. Okay. So you think clean call. If I say like, Hey, let's burn some clean call. You think like, all right, cool. Like, you know, what, what can go wrong with this? You know, it's got clean right in the name. It's got clean in it. You know, it's like, well, and so just a, a wee bit of context, this was a really interesting time, right? If you think about 2008, <clears throat> so in the early two thousands, remember the price of oil skyrocketed. It was like one hundred fifty dollars yeah. a barrel in like two thousand three or four ish. And people were paying like uh, in the U.S. four to five dollars. Yeah, a I, I think it was seven or eight ish. But yeah, 
two thousand seven or eight. Yeah, yeah. So, so coal had sort of been on a downturn, and then the price of oil starts skyrocketing again. So, coal sort of picked back up in terms of 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 its use and its main use, uh, electricity generation. Um, this is right before sort of fracking of natural gas, especially in say like the Marcellus or, or the Utica shales, it had really taken off. It's like, sort of like the beginning of it. So it hadn't been displaced yet. So it still had this really big market share and renewables weren't as uh, uh, cost effective or efficient as they are now, even 10 years later. So it still had like this, this huge market share and it was still to, to most intents and purposes was uh, um, profitable. And so that's, they wanted to keep that going. And that's hey. sort of part of this story here. And so the, the coal lobby had, had some power and had some, some money and, and it wanted to keep this market share and it, it, it wanted to stay where it was at. So <clears throat> it's, it's sort of, I mean, whenever you see someone coming at, like trying to replace it or, or demonize it, mm-hmm. even if it's justifiable, they're going to fight back against it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So that's what was going on during that time period. Um, so usually when you do talk about clean coal, it's often understood that this this term means that the coal plants capture carbon dioxide that's emitted from smokestacks and bury it underground as a way of uh, alleviating essentially climate change, right? The carbon dioxide goes into the air. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and it, it warms up the atmosphere. So, but there's actually several... There's several different techniques of, of this quote clean call. Okay, so <laughs> the one the one type of clean call that uh, people mostly talk about this kind of like this newer emerging technology it is what's known as carbon capture and storage. So this is a technique where uh, basically the, the car you take this carbon dioxide that's uh, it's, it's emitted from when you're when you're burning the coal and it's collected and there, there's actually a couple different ways you can collect the car, take the carbon dioxide out. It's um, but we'll get into that a little bit, but essentially you take this carbon dioxide out that would have otherwise been emitted into the atmosphere and you collect it. All right. And then it's buried into nearby oil fields to, to help extract hard to reach uh, crude oil. So it's actually this, it's, it's pretty basically. So I guess to kind of summarize, we're taking this, this carbon dioxide and then we're storing it underground. So that's the carbon capture. We're capturing the carbon and we're storing it deep underground. So that it's also, uh, so for short, the carbon capture storage is known as CCS. So there's other types of clean coal out there that don't utilize this CCS technology but they emit less CO2 or carbon dioxide than other plants. And so this involves different types of cleaning technologies like scrubbers in the, in the smokestacks. All right. It kind of works to collect the carbon dioxide as it's being emitted, but doesn't take all of it. All right. Um, so you'll see that construction of these types of plants is, it can be very costly and upgrades. If you do want to upgrade from an older coal plant to something like this with the, with more of this, uh, this like scrubber technology, it's, it, it costs a lot of money. And yeah, it's scrubber. also, it's also a lot to maintain as well. Yes. Yeah. And scr- scrubbers have been <clears throat> around a lot longer than say CCS. Yeah. CCS is, is, is relatively new. And I want to say there's only in the world, there's only a couple dozen plants. It's yeah. Not, it's not that much. No, there's. <clears throat> and so one of the issues with CCS, um, if you know, <clears throat> we look at it on the east coast because we have a, a lot of coal fired plants still on the east coast, and we and we have a lot of natural gas plants now that have replaced the coal fire because we have such an abundant access to to uh, natural gas. Um, our stratigraphy is is 
pretty good for it because one of the places you you, you store um, you one of the places it's thought you can store uh, CO two is in a- aquifers. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so I, I was part of a group that that did a study on this um, a couple of years ago because of my my knowledge of the subsurface. I didn't add anything really to it. I was just like, yes, these Don't layers are connected. sell yourself short. Um, but one of the issues that we run into in, in the subsurface is that it's a bit of a mystery. Okay. And um, one, of the, the, one of the main areas of, of research was on the continental shelf. They were looking basically to, to pipe it off, you know, off the Jersey shore and, and, and pipe it into the, the subsurface sediment. But you're piping a gas that's under pressure. You don't really know how the sediments are going to um, respond to it. And one of the concerns was that it would destabilize by pressure, pumping this pressurized gas in the subsurface, it would destabilize sediments on the continental slope so like the, the, the edge of, of the continent where it goes into the deep ocean. More turbidites? Yeah. And it would, it, it would cause an underwater landslide. Yeah. Which has been known to result in, um, say, tsunamis. Little tsunamis. So, <laughs> well. It, it can also, you know, break our transatlantic cables. Yeah, there's that. Is it's, that... Yeah. So I've always heard that story. That's how we learned about turbidites. So this is going off completely, completely off the Yeah, off the coast of Nova Scotia. Yeah, we have a telegraph wire. Yeah, 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 okay. We've talked about this, and they actually, like, timed it. Like, so the the length of your wire will uh, determine its resistance, and they can actually measure the resistance change. So, which brings me to the <laughs> third way that we can uh, have clean coal. Let's see that segue there. That oh, it's beautiful. Oh man, oh man. Uh, all right. So we talked about <laughs> trying to reel it back in, baby. All right. We talked about CCS or carbon capture storage. We talked about scrubbers taking out the the st- uh, the the emissions as they're coming up as they're they're being burned off, and then finally. The third way that we can get this, quote, clean coal refers to a technology where we actually physically wash coal. Yeah, that's my favorite. They're literally cleaning it. They're literally washing coal. <laughs> yeah. All right. So what you do is you, uh, you grind up, you ground up the coal, right? And then you wash it with this water slurry. And what they'll add into this water slurry is the mineral magnetite. So in case you're a novice geologist, you never heard of uh, the mineral magnetite. It's a magnetic mineral, right? It's an iron oxide. And so it makes the density of the water. It makes the density, I'm sorry, not just the water, that slurry more. And so what will happen is the coal will float. The bad stuff will sink. You take out the bad stuff. You take the stuff that's floating and you take that out and you, uh, and you burn that, all right? So there's, three, there's the three general technologies right there on, how, on, on what clean coal is. So- there's, it's a large spectrum, okay? And when someone says clean coal, it's, like I said, to kind of recap, it was purposely made to be a vague term, but there's there's not one technology that refers to clean coal. It refers to all of these different methods that uh, kind of lessen the amount of greenhouse gases. And then we'll also get into like particulate matter, which is really, really nasty stuff. Yeah, and um, there's, there's also all the leftover byproducts of each one of those three. Oh, like, what, do, just, what do you do with just, that magnetite coal well, slurry? Just you, hold what, the phone, <laughs> Joan. Right? Yeah, I, was, uh, yeah, I knew you were going to get to it, so I didn't yeah, want to bring it up. No, I'm yeah, sorry. I spoiled it. Well, no, no. Or the well, two pages down <laughs> yeah. the outline, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so, which, but we'll talk about that coming up uh, later on this episode is, yeah, you can clean this stuff up, right? But what are you going to do with this stuff, right? So that's that's the question. If you're having that question in your head, just hold that thought. We, I promise, we will get to that, right? Um. So, anyways, so this term. Let's just to finish up our discussion on clean call. This term, clean call, is is a really really misleading term, uh, because clean call is still much dirtier than natural gas, nuclear energy, wind, or solar power according to a New York times article. Um, that's where I got 
most of that information from that last segment from. Uh, yeah. It is. Yes. I guess it, dep- if, it depends. If, if it depends all how things, you look at it. If all things being equal, then I would say yes. But I guess I still have Chernobyl, the HBO special in the back of my head. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> it was really good. So uh, nuclear. Yeah. That's are you, a, what? Are you, are you an anti-nuclear person? I'm no. Saying- no, I, I'm not. And, and even after watching Chernobyl, I'm still... Uh, I'm not, I'm not anti-nuclear. I'm not, if we, you know, twist my arm behind my back, do we have to go oil and gas or do we have, or, you know, oil, gas and coal or nuclear? I would still go nuclear, mm-hmm. but you know, all things being equal, solar and wind, I think are where it's at. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm all about the, uh, the renewables. Like I, th- I think it's fantastic. You know, if we solar yeah. is, you know, it's making it's it's evolving by leaps and bounds. That's fantastic. I'm all about that. You know, we just need the way the grid is set up right, right now. We're still dependent on these these quote, you know, these dirtier technologies, mostly coal. You know, we need to. Yeah, the, infra- the infrastructure is in there for this outdated technology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so- well, Speaking of outdated technology, here we go. Beautiful segue. I know where this is going. Let's talk about Word Two. <laughs> <laughs> what year did that come out? I don't even know if Word Two is a thing. I do this every week. Uh, you know, one day I'm actually going to do some research on Word and look at all the different versions of it. Um, I want you to become like a Word historian, and you can just talk I, about I think we are. I, I, I have it. Okay, Jesus. Um, uh oh. Huh. 1991 word. Whoa. Two. Word. Wait. So there was a word too. There was a word too. Yeah. Oh, look at that. See that I didn't make Nailed this it. up. You yeah. Nailed it. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of word and all of your word document formatting needs, the formatting formula is where it's at. So formatting www.formattingformula.com or YouTube forward slash C forward slash formatting formula. Uh, they, can handle all of your word documenting formatting needs. I, I'm I'm assuming back to 1991's Word Two. Uh, I, I could be maybe overselling it. I don't. Know. <laughs> I don't know if anyone. If you still have Word Two, you contact the formatting formula, and I guarantee you they will be able to help you out. I don't know if the formatting formula wants to talk to you if you still are working on work. <laughs> uh, you know, if if, if for anything, point. tell them the geology flannel cast sent you. I have word two. My my dot matrix printer won't work, and uh, <laughs> and I've been I've been locked in this nuclear silo for <laughs> the last thirty years, yes. twenty years, not exactly. thirty years. Of this, you know, thirty. Years. Yeah. Word two came out thirty years ago this year. So, oh my goodness! Yeah, this look at that anniversary for Word happy two. anniversary Word two. Yeah, I appreciate it. Let's but, get Word Microsoft Word to sponsor us. Oh, we should. We should. I'm telling you. <laughs> anyway, uh, honestly, but formattingformula.com, I I've used them. I use them probably. I don't know. Almost weekly, <laughs> to be honest, or or I use their videos or refer to their videos almost weekly. Um, they can help you out with anything from formatting just your table of contents to embedding figures to hyperlinking things to like your table of contents. You can, you know, click on your table of contents and it zooms you right to that portion of your uh, Word document. Um, I talked about this before. It, they can customize your toolbar. So right now, you know, I have my normal like little diskette save thing, my undo, uh, my refresh, and I now have a little back button because sometimes I have to deal with documents that are hundreds of pages long and I, I search for something and I find it, but then I hit this back button and it shoots me back in the part of the document where I was before. So I don't have to like scroll all the way back. It's, it's brilliant. I love it. So they can do all kinds of things like this for you. Um, Formattingformula.com or YouTube forward slash C forward slash formatting formula. And they have all these videos that teach you how to do this. So, you know, you can, you can hire them to do this for you, 
or they can, you know, teach you how to fish and you can be a fisherman for the rest of your life with word. So check them out. Can't say enough about them. Formaticformula.com. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Check them out. So back to our coal discussion. So let's talk about some of the stuff that's emitted when you when you burn coal. So let's talk about some socks and knocks. All right. I thought it was just rainbows and sunshine. Yeah. Am I wrong? Not exactly. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it probably so, makes rainbows and sunsets more prettier. It, it, I don't know about that. It's, See, you the, can't the, argue that sunsets the, the particular, more more beautiful because of coal. No, 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 no. That's the, the, that's the good lobbying tagline right there. Yeah. Where would we be without coal? We'd have no pretty sunsets. Imagine how dull the sunsets would be without <laughs> clean burning coal. Oh, I feel like I'm going to hell just for saying that. So let's talk about uh, the. Some of the fun stuff that's emitted from coal, like I said, there's socks and knocks. All right, so socks and knocks. Uh, socks is uh, base. Uh, let's see, it stands for. Uh, we use like S O for sulfur and oxygen, and the X is the the subscript for basically how many atoms of oxygen you have. So the 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 most common one that you get with the socks is is sulfur dioxide S O two. Right. So the X the X is a variable for the different number of uh, oxygen atoms you can have on there. But the most, like I said, the most common is, is sulfur dioxide. So, so when sulfur dioxide is admitted, it can do, well, I, I uh, it could do, it's not, we can get some pretty nasty stuff coming out of this, but sulfur dioxide eventually can lead to sulfuric acid. All right. It's two SO four. Yeah. We can get into some, I'm, I, it's hard to, I don't want to talk about the chemistry here and get like too complicated about this stuff, but it, it mixes with water in the atmosphere yeah, <clears throat> and yeah. turns into sulfuric acid. Oh man. Lisa Simpson had so a great, done. great rhyme in one of the Simpsons <clears throat> episode. Yeah. Uh, uh, H2SO4 and now she is no more. Something yeah. Like little Sally. Well, yeah, no. <clears throat> yeah. Little Sally wanted a drink but what she thought was h2o was h2so little sally is no more because what she thought was h2o was h2so4 exactly yeah jeez yeah thank little you lisa sally. simpson yeah so she's um, the, the sulfur dioxide when, when it, it it's an it, it's emitted as a gas in the atmosphere it reacts with water vapor in the atmosphere and and basically <clears throat> it it turns into um H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid. And so it's, it's one of the main causes of, of acid rain in, in our country, in the world. Yeah. Fun fact. Pennsylvania has a lot of acid rain. They do. Pretty. And we, another fun fact, it's not from Pennsylvania emissions. It's nope. Ohio. From, yeah. yeah. The Ohio Valley. Thanks a lot. The Ohio yeah. state. Well, it's I, Ohio and Kentucky. I had heard stories that certain states would to to get the better air quality numbers they just made their smokestacks higher so that the emissions <laughs> would go further down i mean that's and that that's part of it um, uh, that's just working smarter that's what that is um you know that's why something like that I, that's why smokestacks are tall right you want to get up so the wind carries it but it, yeah because you run into a problem because like sulfur dioxide and some of these other gases co2 even are um denser than air so they can settle near Six. the yeah they, they basically sink and and that can lead to a whole host of problems too you can have um like in denora pennsylvania i don't know if we ever talked about on the show so denora was you had all these smokestacks from uh i think there was a steel plant so it's out near pittsburgh so it was steel but they would burn coal and and to, they would coke it which is like when you burn it just enough and it turns it even into like pure carbon that it will then burn hotter to mm -hmm. to smelt the steel um <clears throat> and basically what happened was uh 
a layer of, it, it's basically a valley the the city of Denora is in a valley and so these plants were in the, the base of the valley and there was a layer of cold air that had settled at elevation above this layer of warm air so all the emissions put out by the smokestacks uh got trapped because they couldn't read this cold air is denser and so they got they basically got trapped oh. and created this smog or this this all those noxious gases and ended up ended up killing like two dozen people oh my god really yeah. that was 19 i want to say like 1953 something like that denora is that is that the picture where it's like it looks like midnight at yeah. like noon yeah yep. and it, it it almost directly led to the the beginnings of the clean air act oh it's sort of like the the impetus for that but um Sulfur, to, like when you when you get sulfur dioxide mixing and forming acid rain, just real quick, rain is is naturally acidic. So, mm -hmm. if something's neutral, it's a pH of seven. If it's above seven, it's basic. Um, it's so it's, basic. Yeah, and if it's below seven, it's acidic. And rain is is naturally acidic. It's it's like five and a half. I want to say five point seven, something, something like that. Something like that, yeah. Because it's reacting with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so you get carbonic acid, which is acidic. It's in the name. Um, <laughs> so rainwater is naturally acidic. And then when you start mixing in, say, hydrogen sulfide, you drive it down. So there, there's times where, you know, you could get rainwater down into, like, yeah, but, the, the fours. And, and woo! It's getting threes. a little low. Yeah. It, it's, it, it's, it's low. You wouldn't notice it. Yeah. Otherwise, but it's really bad for aquatic life. It's really bad for plant life. I mean, it's, there's some thought that it leads to uh, baldness in humans because <laughs> I don't know if you're out in the rain. And it so, like, well, well, it's also sec. bad for architecture and stuff like that, too. Oh, yeah. Well, 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 lime, and, limestones, yeah. Well, yeah. fun fact. Lime, so, oh, yeah, limestones. Yeah, if you um, – so, you know, Jesse you said the, the acid rain gets down to, like, pH of 4 or so. Do you guys know what the pH of Coca-Cola is? Yeah, it's like uh, two and a half or three, right? Nailed it. Two and a half. Yeah. So now that Coca-Cola will never sponsor our podcast. <laughs> I don't I, know, buddy. You're I in can't. Georgia. I, You're in Georgia. Uh, I in the motherland a, for that. I had a terrible Coke problem. The, this pandemic was the best thing <laughs> well, that ever happened. Well, well you problem. phrase it like that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we've all had a terrible Coke problem. We all lived through the 80s. Speak, speak but I was, yourself, I, I was kind of on like a one a day Coke habit there for a while. But actually... I just, I, I had one over Christmas. Sarah got me a, a few glass bottle Cokes as like a Christmas treat. Uh, it was the first time I had a Coke since like February. Wow. So you took yeah. some, uh, some real time off. Yeah. Boy, it tasted good. It does taste good. <laughs> uh, actually the most. <laughs> I have a bit of a Coke problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Coca-Cola pH of 2.5. Wow. According to this list, RC Cola, pH of 2.38, more I acidic than Coca Cola. I wow. think they just went out of business, RC Cola. Oh, I, bummer. I, I have no idea. Yeah. I don't know. Royal Crown Cola. Yeah. How about that? Um, let's see. If you want to go, enamel, your tooth enamel dissolves below five and a half. So any type of soda. Yeah. Will coffee, start to anything. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, the least. Even rainwater. <laughs> the the least acidic soda I can find, A and W root beer four point seven five. Oh, hmm. yeah. All right, so that's a little fun fact. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, so we did SO two SO two SO two. So let's get at this. So how do you get SO two uh, getting emitted when you burn coal? Well, it depends on how much sulfur content is in your coal. All right, so low like you know uh like the higher the sulfur content in the coal the more so2 you're going to get when you when you uh when you burn it all right so how do how do we alleviate this how do, how do we get the so2 uh, how do we get less so2 being emitted into the atmosphere so we can have a uh, fuel substitution so basically we're just going to pick a lower sulfur content of coal so okay so there's one way of of uh, of, of doing that uh 
we can do these, uh, these fuel treatments to reduce sulfur content, AKA washing. We already talked about this washing. You literally, you, like we said a couple of minutes ago, you wash the, you wash the grounded up coal and you can take, you can separate that sulfur out. And, uh, another way that we can get the sulfur out or the SO2 out, I'm sorry, is something called flue gas desulfurization. And that's once again, we're using these scrubbers. To that's, remove the SO2. that's what I always knew scrubbers to do was to remove the SO2. Yeah. I didn't even know. I didn't know scrubbers could remove CO2 actually. Um, there's uh, yeah. Oh, no, I believe you. Can, I'm not doubting you. I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Or we're personally. Gonna, yeah. yeah. So to actually to remove the SO2, it's actually pretty simple. It's a pretty simple chemical, uh, uh, what's some more like chemical reaction? That's what I was looking for. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> You're really nailing the chemistry here. Here we go. I, I I know my chemistry. So what we do is we we want to get this calcium. All right, and where, what's one of the best? What's one of the easiest ways to get calcium? It's from the mineral calcite. Where do we get the mineral calcite? The rock limestone. All right, so. The chemical formula for calcite is CaCO3, right? And that reacts with the SO2, your sulfur dioxide. And what happens is the byproduct of this is the mineral gypsum. We're making synthetic gypsum here, ladies and gentlemen. And what we'll find out is that this gypsum, the synthetic gypsum actually has a use and it can and synthetic gypsum actually makes up about 30% of all drywall. So, so this is, this is basically win-win we're getting electricity <laughs> and building homes. <laughs> yeah. We're getting, yeah, we're getting gypsum board or drywall out of, you know, gyps, gypsum is a, a mineral <laughs> that's used for this. And so that's, uh, that's one, you know, a third, basically if you buy gyps, if you buy any type of uh, drywall, you have a one third chance that uh, it, it comes from it's it's a byproduct. Yeah, of coal. feel good feel good for yourself. You're being sustainable. You're you're <laughs> taking sulfur dioxide out of the air. There you go. <laughs> no, I mean, like that's that's pretty neat. I, there's and we'll talk about some other things that uh, some of these byproducts of coal combustion is used for, but. I don't know. That that's pretty. I I think that's pretty cool. How we get. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. That's really cool, actually. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it's uh, there you go. There's another little fun fact for the for the podcast for today. So there's your sulfur dioxide. Those are di the different ways to take the sulfur dioxide, or you know, things to use and, and, and um, use from the uh, the byproducts of of burning coal and, and and how to take out that sulfur dioxide. So next on the list, we go down and now we hit the knocks. We talked about the socks and now we talk, now we're hitting the knocks. Knocks, once again, the, uh, this is uh, nitrous oxide and nitrous dioxide. Woo! And uh, not, this is, it's actually from my research on this, about how we get the nitrous oxide and, and uh, nitrous dioxide coming out from the emissions of coal. This is a, chemically, it's more, it's a little more complicated. Um, but for the most part, you know, we're, uh, this stuff, once again, these, when these, uh, the NOx gases are emitted from burning coal, once again, it's going to be a cause for, for acid rain, right? The, the nitric acid. Why can't we just make a balloon factory next to the coal factory and then sell the balloons for $5 a piece in concert parking lots? Yeah. Hippie, hippie crack. That's what they call nitrous oxide, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, and one of the, you know, one of the things that nitrous oxide does, I mean, you know, like you're saying, you can get acid rain from it and, and whatnot, but is it, but it actually, it, whenever we talk about smog, it's one of the main, mm. it, it, it reacts um, with, if there's any VOCs in the air as well, volatile organic compounds, which you get from burning coal as well, but they're just everywhere, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the NOx and, and VOCs react in the presence of UV radiation. So when they get out in sunlight, they, they, they can turn into um, photochemical smog, 
which is, you know, bad to breathe. It's, 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 you know, bad for people with asthma and, and heart disease and so on. Yeah. And it, it's like th- tens of thousands of people a year, they estimate die from this. Yeah. Like this isn't just a inconvenience or, you know, people might think, Oh, it's just climate change. Who really cares? Like they attribute tens of thousands of deaths in the United yeah. States from this. It's, uh, and, and the closer you live to a coal plant, the more likely you are to have asthma. And if you have mm-hmm. asthma, you're more likely to die from it. Yeah. So, yeah. So, well, speaking of asthma, the other thing that's really not good for asthma is this other stuff that's emitted from, from burning coal is the particulate matter. And so that is, I guess the best way to describe particulate matter is just really, really tiny particles that you're breathing in. And that's another uh, thing that causes smog is just these tiny little suspended particles in the air. Think of uh, like a campfire. Have you ever been around a campfire? You know, I, to me, smells lovely. I love a nice campfire smell. Yeah. Get a good campfire, you know. But, uh, and, and for those of you who are old enough to remember um, <clears throat> bars in the 90s or the 2000s, uh, you'd come home from the bar and you, you stunk. You, you would come home from a campfire and you'd stink and you, you didn't, the, the reason you stink is that it was actually little tiny particles are now landing on your clothes, landing on your skin, landing in your hair. And then it stays there. And it, that those particles have an odor as they react with the oxygen in the air. And that's what you're smelling. So when you go home and you smell that campfire, those are actually little tiny particulates that landed on all your stuff and smell. When you came home from the bar and fell asleep and the next day your pillow stinks. Like- they, they've recognized actually that, that that has a health effect too. And it's it's what's now termed third hand smoke. Yeah. So third hand smoke is a big deal. So even like when, you know, Jesse and I are parents, like when you go to the doctor, like, you know, does somebody smoke in the household? Even if they smoke outside, like they ask you that question now, because back in the day it was like, do, do you smoke? Yeah, but I don't smoke inside. Oh, okay, great. Good for you. Now it's like, no, that's not good enough because you smoke outside. You, you know, you're not smoking outside naked. <laughs> You come inside with those clothes on or, or you smoke in the car when the kids aren't in the car, but then the kids get in the car and then there's still all those chemicals and stuff on all the fabrics in the car and things like that. So these particulates, even though they're tiny microscopic, you get enough of them and it really adds up. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking up right now, but, uh, there's always, you hear about this stuff about when you breathe in the air from a campfire, it's as bad as, um, Supposedly, t- smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Have you guys ever heard of that? Oh no, that no. I don't. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> and, and uh, don't get me wrong. I, I've been like downwind and been like, oh god, you know, for a second. And mm-hmm. I, I could see if I stood there the whole time and just breathed it all in, that could be it. Otherwise, I, I disagree with that. I feel like okay. that was a biased science some non-outdoor person trying to <laughs> badmouth campfires how dare they uh in a laboratory study at louisiana state university researchers found that hazardous free radicals in wood smoke are chemically active 40 times longer than those from cigarette smoke so once inhaled they will harm the body for far longer fun All right, well, uh, that does sound like other, a little more science to it but are still. There, other EPA estimates suggest that a single fireplace operating for an hour and burning 10 pounds of wood will generate 4,300 times more carcinogenic polyaromatic aromatic P- yeah. 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 than 30 cigarettes. 4,300 oh. times more than 30 cigarettes. Yes, but 99% know. of that is going up the chimney, not, the, not out into the room. Sitting there yeah. huffing, huffing yeah. a fireplace. Yeah, if, I, <laughs> if I smoke 10 pounds of wood, I could see how that would be 4,300 <laughs> times more than 30 yeah. cigarettes. I need to get my fix, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apples and oranges. Come on, man. All right. So, I, I know. Come on. I, take I those numbers. Take I'm at those a campfire with- a few times a year. Don't take that away from me. Right. Take those numbers with a grain of salt. All right. I'm just, that's just kind of fun stuff there. Or maybe not fun, depending on how you look at it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's let's get moving on now. So 
I mean, talk about this particulate matter. It could be this stuff could be pretty pretty nasty. And so, kind of moving down, let's get into trace elements that are in uh, that are involved with burning coal. So this is like this is what I was always told is like the really really nasty stuff. Not that the other stuff is 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 great. You know, uh, you know the salt so, uh, the sulfur dioxide, the nitrous oxide, and all that stuff. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's greenhouse, they're greenhouse gases and it's, it's, it's not good for the earth, but these trace, trace elements can have like really, uh, like, uh, really bad results for, for, for people. All right. So you can either get these, these trace elements being emitted as either particulate matter or in the gas phase for, for some volatile compounds. Um, but it can be very fine matter, um, or like I said, if it, if it is in that gas phase, it can bypass the electrostatic uh, precipitators. And so basically that's one of the, one the of scrubbers. the filters, the scrubbers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They basically, I, I they use static electricity to, to pull this, this stuff out. Uh, then you also have a different type of uh, filter. You have fabric filters. It can go right through your, your filters to take this stuff out at the, at the coal plants. And then, um, and, and various other types of air pollution control devices. So they're sneaky. This stuff can, can sneak right through because it's, it's, it can be so fine, right? This stuff can be in fly ash, bottom ash, or slags, all right? So let's, while we're on the topic of this, let's talk about the different types of ashes. So when you burn coal, we pulverize this stuff, right? You pulverize it, and then it's blown with air and sent into the combustion chamber. And this is known as flue gas. And uh, as this molten material, it, it actually, it, it, it melts the material. And as this molten material cools, you get fly ash. And fly ash, just as it sounds, it flies up, it's lighter, all right? And this stuff remains suspended. So the fly ash is lighter. And the coarser material is known as bottom ash. It's coarser and it sinks down. And also you have slag. And slag is this gas-like material that comes from... Um, within the, the combustion chamber when you're, when you're burning coal. So the, the, uh, the bottom ash and slag tends to settle at the bottom. Right? Glass like. Yeah. Okay. I heard gas. I just did I say gas? Sure. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I think you did say glass, but I heard gas. So I just yeah. want to, yeah. Sorry. So bottom ash is, is it, or the slag mm-hmm. turns to glass, so, super yeah, cool these, liquid. Yeah. And so these are all, these are all, uh, you can have these, these trace elements, in there, and so we can be dealing with some some really nasty stuff like uh, mercury, arsenic, selenium, uh, chromium, uh, just to, just to kind of name a few real fast off the top of my head. So now you got this. These are this this ash material. These these are these are waste byproducts, and it can have some really really nasty stuff in it. And so now you have to properly dispose of the stuff. If it's not properly disposed of, you're gonna you're gonna have some issues, and what you can have happening is this, this material, these trace elements can leach from, from your waste byproducts. Um, so like I said, uh, uh, I, did I say arsenic, arsenic, yes. mercury, uh, arsenic's a big one. Yeah. 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 I mean, Ar- I mean mercury is, yeah. Bad. Yeah. Uh, mercury, did... um, mercury is and yeah, sorry. And other heavy metals. Yeah. yeah. Lead, selenium, cadmium, boron, um, I believe arsenic is a metalloid. <laughs> so, uh, like company, uh, company, excuse me, countries, uh, developed nations have standards for dealing with this material. So most of the times, it's it, but it ha- it has to be properly disposed of. Otherwise, it can really muck up your things. Like it can cause groundwater contamination. And really, really mess some stuff yeah, up. You're essentially distilling that carbon. And all the other little tiny stuff that was not in the carbon, you're distilling it down into this crap. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're taking Con- hundreds, hundreds of thousands of tons of yeah. carbon and then all the little stuff that was left over. And now you're concentrating it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so what they'll do is I know they'll they'll, they'll keep these this, this material in these like retention ponds for a, a while. Are you, we need to, they need to get rid of this because if it's so concentrated, like it's like Steve said, it's just, it's just really, really nasty stuff. Uh, so one of the other ways that they'll get rid of it is they'll infill geographic features and sometimes they'll just send it right back down into the mines. 
right? And so that has its own environmental nightmare because you send all this concentrated, you know, heavy metals and all this crap down into the mines. If this stuff mixes with the groundwater, then it becomes mobile. And then, yeah, you know, then, then you're contaminating, you're contaminating an aquifer potentially. So you don't right. want to do that. But you, you, you talk to people in a general sense, like lobbyists or, or congressmen or whatever, you're like, oh, yeah, we'll just take all this stuff that, you know, all this byproduct from the coal and we'll just stick it back in the coal mine. <laughs> and it, like, that's you know, where oh, it came from, you know. That, hey. that sounds logical, you know. Yeah, it, yeah, it should we turn it, it to it? Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. but and, it's, it's being put down there in concentrations that's much, much greater than, than what it was taken out as. Exactly. And people don't really, you know, and you, you can spin it to make it sound the way you want it to. And it's yeah, also in it's in it's in a soluble form now. It's not yeah locked in the rock. Right. Yeah. It's, so I mean, you, the same can be said with say you mine uranium, right? Okay, so uranium naturally occurring uranium, it's not going to be like you're not going to be like super worried about this stuff for the most part, right? But then when you concentrate it, nobody wants to be anywhere anywhere near that concentrated uranium, right? Yep. So. Um, so let's see, moving on the cement industry actually has uses for the ash, uh, byproduct. So, uh, and, and we'll, there's actually, uh, there's a lot of, there's actually several uses. This is, there's, uh, there's a bunch of, uh, different ways that we can reuse this, this coal ash. So we can use it for different types of structural fill, uh, like I said, pop, fill it back in with abandoned mines. But well, it. yeah, it's, yeah. it's not good fill. No, and yeah. this has problem. Like, so a lot of the old strip mines in Northeastern Pennsylvania, th they did this in a few of them. They filled in with the fly ash and they found that not only does, does it bad things happen when the groundwater mixes mm -hmm. with it, it leaches out yeah, the, yeah. the heavy metals, but also, even if you cover it, if, if, you know, you still have these fine particulate matters that they found were, were mobilizing and basically aerosolizing and getting into the, the air. And so people were breathing in. Just so, yeah, it's just, it's also out there again. just not good structural fill. It's like, yes. it's, it's like cork or something like yeah, because it know. just settles and settles and settles and settles. It, it, exactly. It, and it, it, mm -hmm. it never actually gets compact. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've been on many a sites in central Pennsylvania where, you know, you dig down and it's just coal ash and coal ash and coal ash. And, and yeah. there at no point can you build on top of it without something settling or, uh, you know, uh, uniform settling is fine in, in structural engineering, but it's when it's not uniform settling, like how yeah. much coal ash is over here? How much is over here? And then, you know, you get all this differential settlement and then things start breaking and going bad. Yeah. So. Um, the one thing, so that's also used as an ingredient in concrete actually used to make cement. These, uh, the, the, the fly ash to make cement. I'm going to get to that in a second. Uh, we talked already about wallboard or, or drywall. And then also it's been known to have been used in, school running tracks so oh okay yeah, I, like i said like it doesn't compact it doesn't compact well so yeah. if it's if it's you know if you know those like i don't know if you guys are old enough to remember like those like cinder tracks they were almost like um it wasn't that cohesive like nice rubbery stuff it was okay. actually like um y yeah when it i wasn't quite gravel but it was when, like I, when I was a kid the the track at the high school used to be like crushed red stone. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it would just tear your knees up. Ooh. Yep. Um, you're running the wrong way. You should run on your feet with sneakers <laughs> on. That's why I never I made the like, track team. You're crawling the hundred yard dash. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. <that>. What is <laughs> wrong with this special boy? <laughs> Everyone is so much faster than I am. <laughs> so he's, just, he's on the ground <laughs> bleeding again. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. this is some of the more like some of those are controversial uh, methods how it's used but there's some some reuses of this uh coal ash that is not controversial my favorite is bowling balls what do you guys think about that i had no idea and as, I 
someone who balls. was an avid bowler for most of my life, I find this shocking. But <laughs> but I don't care. I think it's awesome. But, so the whole thing is to encapsulate it. So yeah, they're exactly got, it's encapsulated. Yeah, yeah. it's encapsulated. You, you know, I don't think uh, that, that the, those pro shop workers who have to drill the holes, maybe, but. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, they're breathing that crap in all day long. Yeah, yeah. But as long as you're not like gnawing, eating your bowling balls. Which, no, I, I mean <laughs> that's that's incredible because some of those. Uh, I'm I'm sure it's not as ubiquitous now because polymers and plastics and all that stuff are much much cheaper. I'm guessing the bowling ball industry is more plastics, but I don't know. I'm gonna I look this up. The bowling ball industry. Ah man, it is fascinating yeah uh the, take a take a look at the anatomy of a bowling ball it's it's pretty interesting i i don't know if you've ever seen a bowling ball where you know you have your, your three holes that the your two your middle and your ring finger and your thumb and usually in between them is a dot and that dot is placed there because that's where they know to drill the holes because the bowling ball is not it's a sphere, but the the center of mass is not a sphere. It's very all right off center. Oh, because of the holes, you're removing that mass. Well, not not only that, but when you if you hold the ball correctly and you spin it correctly, oh, to put it, some it, English on it, it's it's almost like a cylinder of the heavy weight is in the huh. middle, and then that way the ball will spin around that cylinder. And then as it's spinning on the oil and a lane of the bowling ball lane is only oiled in the middle, uh, like 60%. So it's not oiled in the beginning. It's oiled for most of the 60% and then it's not oiled at the end. So the, the bowling ball will spin on that cylindrical center of mass. And then when it hits that non oiled part, that's when it shoots over. Oh, oh and, it, and that's man, when you that's get the hook really going in at the exactly. very end. That is really oh, interesting. Jeez, yeah. we just call this the bowling flannel cast from now. Oh my uh, gosh. Listen, I, I spent most of my Saturday mornings bowling. I didn't know as, that you were as like a kid. And then uh, quarter bowling? I feel like man. Saturday mornings were quarter bowling. Uh it was it was actually youth league. I was in a league. Whoa. Yeah, and then I, you know, I bowled as a young adult, and then I had kids and ruined my life. So, uh, yeah, tell us about this kids ruined your life. <laughs> this took a turn. Uh, yeah. This oh, this geez. really took a hook here at the uh, end of the lane. Uh, <laughs> no, I remember not bowl- expecting that to happen. When I started bowling in a league when I was an adult, I was like, "There's there's twenty year olds and there's sixty year olds. Like, why is there like there's like one team of like forty year olds? Like, what what is going on? Like." is it just a popularity thing i don't know and then i was like oh yeah that's right i had kids and i don't have time for this shit <laughs> yeah. so yeah I, that's really funny i was thinking about <clears throat> the one bowling alley where i grew up and it just had such a distinctive smell and for some reason the smell hit me cigarettes and broken dreams <laughs> yeah there's something like that and just yep you know, just like drinking a beer and sobbing while i rolled the ball exactly <laughs> so yeah, there's, you know, uh, bowling is the most uh, participation sport in America. More more people bowl than like play softball or play on a base- regular basis. Yeah, than play baseball or, you know. I will say Kingpin is, I think, one of the funniest movies I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And probably the most, uh, you know, uh, underground uh, Farley Brothers movie. Yeah, it's a good, oh, it's a- that's a good movie. <laughs> Yeah. Have you so ever good. um have you ever done candle pin candlestick bowling? I have heard not. about it. That's what the hipsters do. It's like a New England thing. I, I wasn't I didn't do it with hipsters. Just found myself what? in New England. Well, you did it did you do it recently? Define recently, like the maybe last, 15, like five, 15 years ago. That's the one where they, the pins are all on it, strings. It, no, the tiny ones. It's like yeah, they're t- like sticks. Oh, I thought I thought I was duck pin bowling. Oh, duck pin. That's the one with the, in the ball. Like you can palm and just yeah. whip it. Yeah. Okay. That's the one that's making her. I don't know. There's a bunch of places in Atlanta that have that now. Or anyway, who was, of... was it? I think Truman put a bowling alley in the white. There was a bowling I, alley. I think he house. did. Yeah. So uh, back anyway. to Cole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no. 
Listen, we've made our bed here. You, you got <laughs> into the depths I, of my. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't realize. Listen, it turns out we're all passionate about bowling. <laughs> that was not scripted. I I did not know that there was that this podcast is going to I take definitely a have a bowling bag, a ball, and shoes in my garage. That's I couldn't amazing. tell you the last time I used them, but they're there. Oh, man. Once COVID. Once COVID wait, uh, cleans up, man, uh, next time I come up to Philly, we're going to spend a night going bowling. How yes. About yes. Yeah. I'm in. All right. So back to coal ash. All right. Another thing that coal ash is used for is to make Portland cement. So I, I heard about this Portland. I, I don't work. I've never worked in construction or anything like that before in my life. So I looked up what Portland cement is, and it's oh. basically just the most widely used type of cement because it resembles uh, Portland in – oh, I'm going to botch this now that I'm trying to think of it. Something about in England. Uh, there's some area in – anyways, <laughs> leave it at that. I've never – look at these hands. These are baby hands. I've never lifted a <laughs> shovel in my days. <laughs> I have two Portland cement stories. When can I tell them? Just right now. Just, <laughs> just so now. So – the first one is sort of just an interesting anecdote. How do you have um, Portland cement stores? I've never even heard of this until today. And he's got two stories. Are you kidding me? You've never I've heard never of heard Portland of, cement. So no, I've never heard oh of my God. the main source of cement. Yes. Yes. It's um, the, yes thank you. So it's a mixture of like limestone and, and sand or, or clay with and apparently water. Coal and, you, ash. and you cook it, you bake it. Um, so there's, there's this, there's an outcrop. There's there's these layers of rock in um, oh shoot I just blanked on it someplace in Italy in the Apennine Mountains mm-hmm. and there's a quarry there and there's these alternating layers of limestone and and shale and clay where the ratio is perfect where you can just quarry out these beds of sandstone shale and clay and, and limestone and you add water and just cook it in cement mm-hmm. and like the romans knew this and, and so on and so forth and it turns out these alternating layers are also milankovitch driven so oh. level going up and down and so it's it's really cool and my second story is when you by the way that's called roman cement i'm on the oh, look the at website you. right now look at <laughs> so when you bake it, it actually turns into a, a distinct mineral called Portlandite. And Portlandite is, uh, it's pretty soluble. It, it de- depends on if you mix the ratio wrong, especially. But in between, so the two, two, two big buildings at, at Temple, Anderson Hall and Gladfelter Hall. I think Steve knows this story. They're, they're they're limestone, or at least their facades are limestone. And so there's a tunnel that sort of connects them at, at street level. And when you walk under it, a lot of times where these limestone panels meet, there's basically a, a, a seam of, of cement that could mortar, essentially. But it, it's, it, uh, it creates these little stalagmites, or stalactites, where it's just like you know, dissolving out. And for a while, um, young earth people who, who don't believe that the earth is, you know, 4 billion years old would use this site at temple as one of their like go-to arguments. They would be like, people say stalactites and caves take thousands of years to form, but these buildings were built in the 1960s and you have similar stalactites not factoring in that this isn't actually you know, cave. rock. It's, it's mm-hmm. Portlandite. Mm-hmm. It's the solubility of the acid rain mixing with this improperly mixed Portland cement mortar. Yeah. And that for our geochemistry class, you actually had yeah. to like solve the, uh, the chemical. Uh, yeah. You had to model out the, use the chemistry modeling program to do the yeah solubility coefficients of like the portland i and and, and figure out what the timing would be and the timing is like five years or yeah <laughs> it's it's actually really not that time. long yeah. Yeah, yeah they've they've since they've since 
gotten rid of it and they've um well actually that tunnel's gone now uh little park I, I, I drove past it i didn't i didn't yeah, actually look but it looks real it. nice so yeah it's, yeah it's fancy but even before that they they got rid of all that and just Paint proper it. sealant on it. Yeah, <laughs> they, paint. over it. they painted it gray. Yeah, it looks <laughs> like limestone. Good enough. All right. So Portland cement. I I, uh, I said it was from somewhere in England. I just want to <laughs> give shout outs to where it's deserved. Loop Portland cement here. was developed uh, from natural cements made in Britain, beginning in the middle of the 18th century. Its name is derived from its similarity to Portland Stone, a type of building stone quarried on the Isle of Portland in Dorset, England. There you go. There you All go. right. Now, uh, another but, interesting fact, if you take your PG exam, there are questions about cement on the PG exam. And it'll be like, yeah, there's a quarry nearby to add aggregate to your cement mixture. The quarry nearby contains X, Y, and Z. Or you have a quarry, uh, you know, 30 miles away that has that quarries, you know, A, B, and C to add to your cement. When you're doing a mixture, you know, like this is a legit question, like which quarry would you source your aggregate from? So, and you have to know the difference, what the quarry is quarrying, what what it is. And basically, uh, chert and cement equals no bueno. Do you do you get like clinkers when you heat it up? You get you get this dissolution effect, and you actually oh. get like a little bit of melt, almost like it, the cement almost turns to mush around the chert because of the microcrystalline quartz and how it reacts with the limestone and stuff. And you actually get really really weak concrete from chert. Hmm. I've heard that. Yeah, yeah. So. Like just, you know, interesting things like that, like the, the different properties of concrete. So for your PG exam, if anyone's listening, these are legit questions. So uh, just, you know, Chris may have his PhD, but it sounds like he couldn't pass his PG exam. Ooh. Oh, that's a snap. burn. That's oh. a burn right there. <laughs> Woo. You know what? I'm going to take that and uh, just out of spite right now. No, I, I, I hear you, Chris Seminac, PhD, and Jesse Thornberg, <laughs> PhD, and Steve. <laughs> Master PhD. Steve. Yeah. MS. First of all, I'm not going to lie. Chris Seminac, PhD, versus Master Steve. Which one sounds awesome? Yeah. Uh, Master Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. So... <laughs> Fun fact about concrete and cement. I uh, I know we're going way far down the rabbit hole right now, but I I I, I thought this. I never knew the difference because I've never worked in in ho- like construction or home improvement or anything like that. So there is now a, you know, a lot of people interchange the word concrete and cement, but there's actually uh, there's a difference. Cement is a is an ingredient in concrete. Concrete is a mixture of aggregates and paste. And uh, these aggregates are made of sand, gravel, and crushed stone. And the paste is uh, made of water and Portland cement. So cement will make up 10 to 15% of the concrete mix by volume. So there you go. Yeah. Fun, fun little yeah. fact. Cement is a constituent. It's a, it's a, it's a, or I guess you could say concrete has cement in it. Yeah. Plus so so the, essentially Portland's more expensive. <laughs> sure. No, but I, I, I mean, I, uh, so for it. instance, when you're drilling wells and stuff, uh, there's a difference between if you grout it with Portland or if you grout it with cement. Oh, okay. If you grout it with Portland, that's usually better, but that's usually like a lot more cost because there's no aggregate in it. There's no Standard things gravel. taking, yeah, there's yeah. nothing taking up that yeah. space of the Portland. So, yeah. Um, and then also to get back to the, the coal ash thing that we got off in this crazy tangent on, uh, back in February of 2014, the U.S. EPA basically uh, they, they used a new, newly developed methodology and they determined that coal ash and other coal combustion residuals were safe to use in concrete um, you know, to, as a substitute for Portland cement and the use of flue gas desulfurization, gypsum. 
uh, basically, uh, so for that, you could take the, the synthetic gypsum out and use it in drywall. And the EPA, as of 2014, says it's, it's good to go. Yeah, so gyp, the, the chemical formula of gypsum is CaCO3SO4, I think. Uh, it, it's basically calcium carbonate with sulfur. So basically you take that scrubbed, this the stuff from the scrubbers that we talked about earlier. Gypsum can, is... Gypsum's the chemical form for gypsum is CaSO4. CaSO4. Thank you. Two H two O. Two H two O. Yeah, it's a hydrous. Yeah. Yeah. So you you take that uh, stuff you scrubbed out of the coal stacks that that SO two, and you can accumulate it enough to turn into gypsum, is what it sounds like. Yeah, that that's where the that's yeah that's where the synthetic gypsum is is coming from. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of uh, I don't know, that's that's what they're they're doing. You, so you can use some of this these uh would otherwise be like these like toxic byproducts from uh, burning coal, and there are some uses for that. So. Um. So I feel like we have a whole other episode in us. Yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, I'm looking at uh Yeah, we are the rest of our outline. And <laughs> what should we do? Coal part three. We Man. we could easily do coal part three if you guys want to. Uh, I I feel like it. I feel like we need to. I, yeah. I, but just the listeners out there, we're, we're you know, I promise it's going to be coal part three. So it, it won't go to coal part four. So if you're if you're starting to get bored with coal. Which Jesse can attest. I don't. I don't know. I don't know how you could. Is that possible? It's impossible. <laughs> uh, we we will try to wrap it up in our next episode. Um, but we have some, you know. Yeah, we haven't we haven't even talked about the disasters yet. Yeah, like yeah. acid mine drainage. We yeah. haven't talked about the the essentially how from 1830 to 1850 the whole planet was illuminated from coal gas Every, yeah. everything came from coal gas so what is coal gas oh, we could talk about that for an hour man, and oh man uh yeah acid mine drainage centralia uh yeah geez, oh, me. How, how do you clean it up you know yeah uh so that was my it, bread and butter for a good half a century half a decade yeah and steve actually uh when did steve very early on in the reboot, Steve told a story about how he uh Oh almost exploded. Yeah. Almost yeah. Jesse yeah. and I were, were sitting at the bar waiting for Steve to show up and uh just come flying Steve through goes, the air and land on the hood of a car. I, we we just what was what did he say? I forget the we, we texted, we're like, Where are you at, man? He goes, I just uh what I don't know. Yeah. We just pierced through a uh yeah. oh you thought you hit a natural gas line, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we uh, we were at a bar and we purposely went to a bar in the neighborhood and just got a seat near the window in case we saw a big fireball. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I really thought I was going to be done early that day. I was not. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, yeah. So let's uh, let's I so that's pretty good. I think let's talk about like the emissions of coal, and then this part three will go into more in depth about kind of some other uh you know the other issues gloom of it if you will yeah it's just, uh so it's not going to exactly be a, a feel-good hit of the summer uh this is no <laughs> and, and i mean listen coal, the coal gasification uh let's be honest like it illuminated cities for sure a, essentially a century and is that the same thing as town gas yes exactly okay, no, no, no. and and even the disasters we could we could talk about Hey, we learned from this. Hopefully, we yeah. don't do these things anymore. I get uh, some that happened as recently as 2008. So, uh, yeah, it's, no, there's it's, been a lot of learning going on for a long time. Yeah. Every once in a while, I go out uh, like mineral hunting with like, uh, and I was just in Delaware County not too long ago and f- like was crossing a creek 
a tributary to a creek and the tributary to the creek was like bright orange and i was like well "Well, this is not good that's no I've bueno. seen this That's before. The, yeah, this is not supposed to be happening. So Delaware County is southeastern Pennsylvania, like right on the border of Pennsylvania and Delaware. And, and where I was in Delaware, like, you know, it was a tiny tributary. Like, this shouldn't have been. I, I don't know. Did you figure out what happened? No, nah, I just kept going. I was looking for a Yeah, it could be a lot of things. I mean, it could just be like, it could be. It, anyway. it was right okay. off of a major highway, so I wasn't sure if. Yeah, I mean, but not, even the then, I, I the the amount of bright orange, like it was bright orange, like your coal hat, like, mm. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that's that's no good if you see creeks like that. But, um, all right, so let's wrap it up. I think that's. I think we should go through to uh, part three of coal oh, for next man. week. This is fun. We've never done like a in depth an in-depth podcast on a topic like this. I feel like we're doing like a, a Dan Carlson, hardcore history, you know, yeah. 15 <laughs> episodes on world war one, you know, <laughs> I love, it. I love uh, it. Yeah. I'm, I'm into it too. And it's just, and, you know, and, it's just a huge, huge topic. And if honestly, if we, you can't cover this topic in, in, in a one hour podcast or two, one hour podcasts or even three, one hour podcasts. I mean, to get a lot of this information, I was reading through textbooks and stuff, and like there's textbook after textbook after textbook written on this stuff, and it's just it's just it's an enormous yeah. again topic. this 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 uh one mineral, if you want to call it a mineral, because it's, it's technically it's not a mineral, it's not even a mineral, <laughs> nope. uh, mineraloid, mineraloid, uh, spawn this science, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, that reminds me. I have a good textbook about it up in my attic. I gotta go dig it out. But uh, but that that brings up a good point. In that, um, if we've covered a topic and you thought like, hey, I'd like them to revisit that topic, or I'd like them to go a little more in depth in that topic, shoot us an email at geologyflannelcast and let us know. Um, we often, not often, but you know, every 10 to 20 episodes or so we do a listener question episode. So if you actually have a question on a specific topic, let us know. Um, and again, if we didn't cover something as in depth as you would have liked, let us know. So we're in, we're in it to win it. There you go. So we want to win your hearts and your minds and more importantly, your subscriptions. (laughs) <laughs> so very good steve Thank you. um <laughs> geologyflannelcast.com if you uh you can also go there if you would like to help out the flannel cast a little bit uh we got some mugs you can buy a lovely coat of arms geology flannel cast mug i'm holding up right now uh you can get some stickers there or and we also got t-shirts and Woo! There, hoodies so. yeah t-shirts hoodies all that cool stuff so uh check out some of that merch uh the other way to help out the flannel cast is if you'd like to become a patreon subscriber so we have different tiers the lowest tier just starting at only two dollars a month uh, that helps out a ton so mm-hmm. um we appreciate For- all of our all of our patreon supporters if you uh if you become a quartz level uh patreon supporter at five dollars a month you can hang out with us on the um yeah we have some the- hanging out with us right now thank you very much yeah uh so uh our patreon friends are always it's cool they're always uh sending us little little chats during the uh you know chiming in during uh during the um the podcast so that's fun it's always fun. and you can hang out with us for a little bit too and before yeah, and after the like podcast frank called us the cement is a glue that holds it all together <laughs> Thanks, that's frank. one of our patreons uh but uh, and honestly what what do we figure uh for 50 bucks a month you can eat your nightly yogurt with jesse is that yeah is that what we decided to me yeah be great there's, there's um, currently no tier for 50 dollars a month no i know but uh jesse's yes. wife wanted to eat her yogurt next to jesse while we were podcasting and we told her no because she wasn't a patreon so <laughs> she had to leave tough crowd tough crowd yeah here, so. I, listen you know we're if anything we're strict yeah <laughs> so anyways uh if you'd like to help with the podcast that way otherwise uh you know subscribe to us uh on all the we're on all the podcasting you know directories you obviously found us so uh we're on youtube subscribe to us on youtube leave some comments on youtube that's always fun i try to get back to everybody that leaves a comment uh leave a comment on itunes all that fun stuff so yeah uh, and for the for the new year tell a new friend about the podcast friend friend. yeah 
So, um, well, anyways, thank you, everyone. Thanks to all of our Patreon uh, subscribers out there. Uh, thank you so much. Appreciate you guys and everyone for listening. Thank you, Formatting uh, Formula. Check out the, the, the Formatting Formula and also check out the new and improved. I forgot to say, yep. Th I, thank you, Maddie. She just chimed in on the. <laughs> She's trolling Instagram. us right now. Thank I you know. for our one Instagram post. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting on it. Yeah, okay, I'm, about to put, I'm about to put the second post. Get ready. I got a yeah. picture we can put up. Oh, yeah. We're, we're getting the, the Instagram rebooted, all right? Because that's where it is. The Insta. Um, we're on Twitter at GeoFlannelCast. Facebook.com slash geology flannel cast. And I believe that's it. So, all right, everyone. Thanks for listening. We appreciate everybody. We love you guys. And we'll see you next week with call part three. Whoa. Thanks, all everybody. Right. Take care. Bye.